Pois, se calhar vamos começando. So, thank you very much. We have today the honor to have with us uh, Christian Kettles. Christian is one of the world uh, wide most recognized uh, specialists in uh, competitiveness and uh, innovation. He had been uh, teaching for Harvard for a long time. He was also involved in lots of studies in which concerns lots of countries. And uh, he challenged the discussion to be here with us, speak about competitiveness and about the 30 years of the Porter Report. As you know, we are making a cycle about this 30 years of the Porter Report. We made already some discussions. To tomorrow, we are having a very good discussion about innovation with two very interesting Portuguese specialists, Anna Lehmann, that is professor in the Faculty of Economics for Porto and uh, was Secretary of State and has a long tradition in these topics, and Francisco Pelos, that is uh, now the Dean of INSEAD, and this all very upsetting part. But, uh, okay, uh, speaking about today, the idea is that Christian will speak about 20, 25 minutes, he have a presentation, he will speak about competitiveness, what is competitiveness, what is competitiveness today, what are the key factors for this competitiveness, and we will also speak about Portugal, and then we will have a discussion with lots of interesting people we have here. Christian, thank you very much for this uh, possibility, it's an honor to have you with us, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the The honor is all mine. Uh, you know, especially at this this uh, very interesting day after your election. Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, I'm tempted to say welcome to the club uh, of countries that have a very difficult political situation. Uh, that's true both for uh, my uh, uh, my home country of Germany, where where I've grown up and spent a lot of years uh, growing up, uh, but also for the country that I live in now, uh, Sweden, uh, which has a minority government that's supported by a populist right wing party. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's new for Portugal. In some ways, it's uh, a new normality that you'll see uh, in many European countries. As Jaime said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you uh, anything much detailed about Portuguese competitiveness. I didn't do a new study uh, 30 years after the Porto report. Um, what I will talk about, um, and uh, let me use the opportunity to share my slides. What I want to talk about um, is, is, is really how that concept is still relevant. And in fact, you know, I think it is in some ways uh, uh, very relevant today, more relevant than it has been for some time at the European level. But quite frankly, I think it might also uh, uh, provide un some insights on the situation in Portugal, including you know, what led to this uh, uh, political outcome. Now, you, know, you, you have to be the judge of that, um, but I think uh, some of these topics we'll see uh, uh, coming up over, over the course of the presentation. So what I wanted to talk about is basically uh, three things. And I want to talk a little bit about why competitiveness has become relevant again. Uh, you know, we had a discussion in the past in Europe about this. Um, and for, for quite a long time, we actually didn't talk so much about competitiveness, but now it's, it's really high up on the agenda, certainly in Brussels uh, and many other capitals as well. What has changed? Uh, you know, after 30 years, I think uh, a lot of things have changed in the economy. I think a lot of things are still need to change in our conception of what competitive is and what drives competitive economies today versus where we were 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. And then finally, I'll conclude with, with some, you know, very preliminary, if you will, uh, uh, you know, thoughts or hypothesis, maybe something to discuss about the Portuguese uh, situation. So competitiveness is back uh, on the agenda, uh, you know, you certainly recognize that over the last year, the Swedish presidency uh, of the EU Council talked about competitiveness as a new communication out to actually about long term competitiveness of the EU. Um, many events, many publications that kind of put competitiveness in the title. And, you, you know, you would think that somebody like me that that works on competitiveness is really thrilled about that. Uh, but I think, the, uh, you know, the, the, the driver of this, of course, is that um, uh, it's because there is a worsening of our economic situation. Uh, you know, the IMF uh, basically showed that uh, in, in, in its projection talked about the European Union economy or the Eurozone uh, with very weak growth um, this year and next year, uh, the recent projection of the European Central Bank was even worse. So, you know, instead of 0.9, 1.7, their projection is 0.6 for this year, 1.5 for next year. Uh, and remember, you know, we're still in a period where we're sort of recovery have, have recovery effects um, after the pandemic, where we, uh, of course, had a, had a significant crisis. So economic times are weak. 
And I think the reason actually that politicians are now kind of focusing on competitiveness is because their voters are very unhappy. Um, we have a lot of inflation, uh, had a lot of inflation over the last year and a half, uh, energy prices, food prices, but a lot of other things as well, a real deterioration of uh, real incomes in many parts of the EU. And actually, if you look at the drivers of the weak GDP growth uh, throughout the Eurozone economy, it's largely because private consumption is so weak. And private consumption is so weak not because people are unemployed, which was the explanation in the past, but people are still employed, but their wages have not gone up in line with inflation, and they appear poor, and they, they are concerned about the future. Uh, rising interest rates is another factor uh, that plays into it. Of course, it's a reaction in part uh, of the ECB's change in monetary policy reacting to inflation. But in some countries, it's also, uh, and you know, the country where I live now, Sweden, uh, it's also because uh, consumers are highly interest rate sensitive. Uh, some countries, and this, uh, Sweden is one of them, uh, a lot of the, uh, the mortgage, mortgage, mortgages uh, financing homes are flexible rates. So as soon as the interest rate goes up, people have to spend a lot more for their housing uh, uh, debt. Um, in other countries, it's more effect on the on companies and their, their interest rates. So we are in a difficult situation. That's why politicians have started to talk about competitiveness. But what worries me is that we actually don't have any clarity in that discussion about what competitiveness is. Uh, low growth, low short-term growth is not necessarily competitiveness. Um, doing something to kind of uh, revive our economies in a cyclical downturn is very different from what I would understand is competitiveness is sort of long-term uh, 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 foundations of, of, of prosperity. Uh, and because there is no clarity in that political discussion about what competitiveness is, there's also no productive dialogue on what should be done. Uh, I mentioned the Swedish um, uh, presidency of the EU uh, they now have a center-right uh, uh, government, and so they focused a lot on we need free trade and we need less, less bureaucracy and open markets, all things that I generally believe in, uh, but I'm also not quite sure that this is the central answer at the moment uh, to the problems that we're facing uh, uh, in Europe. And the question is also, you know, how do we align this with, with other key goals uh, like social inclusion, green transitions, and other goals that haven't gone away, um, that are still there alongside uh, our, our quest for higher growth? For Europe, actually, what I'm much more worried about than the short term is the longer term picture. And here, you know, here's some, da some data for the OECD, for the G20 and the G7 countries together, uh, uh, for the OECD members and the G20 members together. And what you see here is sort of huh? expected long term growth rates over the last couple of de uh, over the next couple of decades. And what we see is that our growth rate is actually comparable to the U.S. according to these models that don't assume kind of big shifts and shifts in, in, in policy. I think they are actually quite generous to, uh, to Europe, but we are going to fall behind, significantly behind others. Uh, you know, increasingly India, uh, where I've, I've done a lot of work recently as well, but also China. So I think we, what we see is sort of the, 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 the locus of growth, of global growth is moving away. Our trend growth rate is going to be low. Uh, and we need to think about what that means for the dynamics of our economies and our societies. That's, I think, the real challenge, competitiveness challenge that, that Europe is facing. It's also important to remember that we've been there before, as I said. You know, in, in fact, in 2000, we had the Lisbon strategy. This was the last time that the, that the European Union set itself the goal of becoming the most competitive continent uh, in the world. Uh, we did a lot of things right, but we also have to recognize that we didn't achieve our goals. Um, so I think we need to learn about what actually went wrong uh, in, in, uh, in the past. Um, you know, Michael Porter and I, I, I tried to look at this a little bit uh, a few years ago, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of those analyses that were done before the pandemic still hold. Um, we've done a lot of things in Europe. Uh, in fact, I would say, you know, the, that the European Union driven policies have generally led to more productivity enhancing policies, more market liberalization, more focus on innovation uh, and so on. Uh, but the challenge is that we have a very complex architecture in Europe. Uh, we have regions, we have member countries, we have the EU, um, and we need to figure out kind of how we can mobilize that architecture in a better way. Uh, we used to talk about this in terms of more or less Brussels, but I think that while we need to concentrate some things in Brussels, the, tr the attempt to sort of drive a competitiveness agenda from Brussels 
has not really worked. And one, one of the reasons is that we've become much more heterogeneous over the years. The differences in, in Europe are huge. They are larger than within the US and already in the US they are quite large. And so kind of what's right on average for Europe from a perspective in Brussels is actually not particularly appropriate to Portugal or to Bulgaria or to Denmark or Sweden. So we need to find a better way to kind of strengthen all different parts of our union uh, in the appropriate ways, at least on the microeconomic level. Then there are other areas like the single market and macroeconomic policies where I definitely think we need combine, to combine our sources and, uh, forces uh, and have a, a, a common playing field across the EU. But I think we need to kind of rethink the way that we drive European competitiveness and the role that the EU can play uh, in this context. So happy to discuss that, uh, that a bit more if, 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 if there's interest. Now, that's the situation in Europe that we're currently facing. Uh, but again, you know, uh, we, we're, we're talking today about sort of the, a study that was done 30 years ago. So, so how has our thinking really changed on competitiveness and what is still the same? I would say that I would say that the, the, the key pillars, the key foundations of this productivity based view of competitiveness still hold. So the idea is that we want to understand what helps certain locations to really support a high level of standard of living for their citizens. So that's really what we're interested in. It's not necessarily about world market sh uh, shares. It's not necessarily about unit labor costs. It is about how do we drive a high standard of, uh, of living. That, in, in, uh, you know, the research shows, is very much driven by productivity, and that, in turn, is driven by locational circumstances. That's sort of what government policy at different levels uh, can affect. So it's, it's not, per se, about low wages or weak currency, which can help you sort of get to a trade balance or increase your exports, but actually don't themselves necessarily do a lot um, for, for, for prosperity or these, 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 these other issues that I mentioned there. So that's still there, but what has changed? Well, first of all, I would uh, say what, what has changed is what our societies expect. When we had the discussion three decades ago or two decades ago, it was a lot about jobs and basically GDP per capita. How do you create economic outcome and uh, output in our economies? If you now look at this, uh, you know, and I think that's true whether, whether, whether I work here, whether I work in Asia or in North America, it's a much broader spectrum of outputs that people are interested in. So we need to think about a more disaggregated and de-averaged way to think about prosperity. It is about social inclusion. So I think there is a concern that you know, the average does not really capture whether or not living conditions are changing for the broad majority uh, in our society. And you know, I think an interesting question is whether that is also a factor in Portugal, um, where like, you know, I think the overall numbers look quite OK, but apparently a large part of your population isn't happy with it. Um, it's about sustainability. We all know, you know, and that's, again, also true in, in, in emerging and developing countries that uh, climate change is real and we need to address it. But it's sort of need, so we need to balance uh, our growth with better uh, environmental outcomes. We need to have societies that are more sustainable in the face of shocks. Uh, and we need to also think about the non-GDP parts of, uh, of the quality uh, of life. So this complicates things a lot. Um, economists like to Say, you know, since Tim Bergen, you know, if there, if for every goal, one policy instrument, we now have a much broader set of goals that we need to think about and that we need to hit uh, in parallel. So that also means we need to think about our, our analytical tools, not just in terms of product, uh, productivity and GDP per capita, but how they reflect uh, on this broader set of tools. Second observation is that, of course, the economics have also changed. You know, the, the, the very fundamental factors of how the economy looks like. Uh, one issue is labor markets. <clears throat> uh, the labor market situation has significantly improved. I mean, we still have issues with unemployment and with certain groups of society that have a very, find it very hard to get into the labor market. But I would say, especially in Europe, we actually made quite a bit of progress on that side to reducing the entry barriers to the labor market. And due to the demographic change, we're probably entering a new phase where it's really not so much about finding a lot of jobs for people that come into the labor market, but where we have to think much more about how we can enhance the quality and productivity of those that are in the labor market and their jobs. So sort of the task has changed. And, uh, you know, I, I recently was in, in, in Hungary uh, where, where I saw this and, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether there are parallels to Portugal. 
you know, they very much have a, have a growth model that's based on FDI attraction, getting people in to, to invest in factories so that they create jobs for the local population. But now they find out they're in a situation where essentially if the Chinese build another battery, battery factory in the east of Hungary, they also have to import the workers because actually there is not that many people that they need to find jobs for. It's much more about upgrading and higher productivity. So the, the politicians have to recognize that what we're trying to do with our strategies is changing. Digital revolution is changing market structure. So we need to think about how that affects our view of the world, uh, you know, whether there's high dominance on the equity markets, on the real markets uh, of a few players. How does that affect our thinking? Um, industry is not a lot as large a force anymore uh, as it used to be. Um, after the global financial crisis, Europe set forth this, this strategy of having a high industry share in GDP. I think we increasingly see that we're, we're kind of going against the waves here. Um, not because we've stopped buying manufacturing goods, uh, but we, because we as, as the world have become so productive in producing manufacturing goods that we actually we just don't need that many people. And a lot of the, the at least the job growth and, and uh, employment in the future will be more in service sectors. So we need to have, have a conception of what's going on in our economy that kind of recognizes these fundamental changes uh, in industry. And then the third and maybe, maybe uh, uh, you know, one of the more fundamental observations. So I think when, when Porter developed his notion of competitiveness, uh, it was basically saying, you know, that we, I need a model to understand what drives productivity. And those locations that are most productive are going to be the most prosperous because essentially we're, we're competing on a pretty good market and good in the sense of, you know, a, uh, an effective market uh, uh, and uh, that, that, that is not kind of characterized by market power um, where everybody is a, is a price taker. And that was true, increasingly true, I would say, during the last phase of globalization because we removed trade barriers. A lot of countries liberalized, as I said, you know, including in the EU. So I think there was more and more a sense that um, it is really about your productivity and your innovative capacity uh, that is determining your future. What we're seeing now more recently um, during, you know, through these geopolitical uh, strides, but also through the re-emergence of industrial policy at scale, you know, including by the United States, that it's not just productivity, that productivity is still critical for how much value you create. But in terms of how much value you capture, it also depends on your leverage, uh, on your economic size as a market, uh, on the financial resources that you can muster, uh, on the military power that you have, on the influence that you can have on regulatory standards and so on. So you also think you have to think about the leverage that, that you have. Now, leverage means somebody has to use it. So it's not only leverage, but it's also the ability of the political system to use available leverage in a coherent sense. So the other factor is, you know, the quality, if you will, of our public system, uh, our ability to set strategies, for example, and make long-term choices in how we use leverage for our benefits in the long term. Um, and I think, you know, there in, in, in Germany, I'm just involved in an effort around competitiveness. I think there are a lot of concerns actually more about the strategy competence of the political system rather than necessarily the foundations of productivity that are under challenge but are still uh, are still pretty so strong. So competitiveness, I think we have to think about as something that has changed and we need to adjust our thinking uh, uh, to it. What we've learned also over the last couple of years is uh, you know, our view on how to figure out what a country needs to do. And I think I mentioned that in, in, in earlier discussions that we had also with the Port uh, Portuguese uh, audiences. So one is around the what countries need to do. Um, there are many things that matter. So, you know, we might pinpoint one or two. And uh, I think our, our thinking is often around, you know, this one silver bullet. If we have better risk capital markets in Europe, for example, you know, we would, we would succeed. The reality is more complex. Uh, better risk capital markets would be a really good and important thing for Europe, but we need to have a lot of things that sort of work in coherence in order to achieve uh, higher levels of competitiveness. What you need to do depends on where you are. Uh, so this context specificity, location specific set of policies, you have to really understand where you are to know what the next right steps are. It's not a blueprint where you just can follow others, I think is important. Uh, but despite that kind of need to have location-specific policies, there are still general rules and, 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 and methods that we, that we can derive. 
Now, for me, maybe even more important is, and, and I've seen that in my work over the last decade, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure also the smart people on this call uh, in, in Portugal sort of know and agree maybe even 80, 90 percent of what needs to happen in the country. The question is often getting it done. Uh, and getting it done partly has to do with how you sequence things. Um, you know, where can you start? What's the right type of political strategy to get reforms uh, done? How do you get momentum? What does need to happen first so that the second reforms can, can generate economic value um, and so on? That's an important observation. Second, and that's maybe coming from our, our, our sort of intellectual home at a business school, um, economists always look at market failures and benchmark where you are relatively weak. And I'm an economist, but I think I've learned that you also have to look at where you are actually relatively strong. What are the competitive advantages that you have as a location? For what type of activities are you particularly attractive, given the specific circumstances and locational assets and capabilities that you've created? So thinking about strengths as well, I think, is important. And then, of course, the change process we know requires uh, certainly in advanced economies changed by men, you know, it requires change in government, but that's already not a unitary factor. It's regions, it's different agencies, the central government, but also the private sector, also groups like this, you know, the, the ones that we have here, also academic institutions and research institutions. So mobilizing that process, I think, is increasingly uh, an uh, uh, important factor uh, determining the competitiveness uh, of countries. What that requires is sort of a, a, a strategy. And what do I mean by strategy? Often I think in economic context, it's, it, it's used as just an action plan. Uh, so a lot of countries have an, an outcome ambition and say, you know, this is the GDP growth or what other type of goals that we want to reach broader now than it was before. And then we have an action plan. What's often missing is the value proposition. So what does your location actually stand for? And I do think Portugal needs to have a clear narrative around that. Um, I think in the past it was, you know, partly your tourism, but I think in industry much more that you actually had industrial capacity at a lower cost than the rest of Europe. But that's not as easy to communicate nowadays, uh, you know, given that you have alternatives in Eastern Europe and maybe other parts of the world as well. So where do, what does Portugal now stand for uh, that, that kind of investors should understand? And then the delivery structure. Uh, you know, how do we organize ourselves to make sure that we actually deliver on this value proposition and create the type of uh, Portugal and, and, and business environment in Portugal that's important. On the bottom, you see the actions. I think some are cross-cutting, some are cluster-specific, and I think that was already embedded in Porter's study and Porter's work uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, I think what we've learned over the process that, that is that this process, is, this is not just about a sum of individual cluster efforts. Those are sort of spare heads and dynamic engines, but you also need to think about the, the, the overall portfolio and things that kind of complement each other uh, along that. Let me skip this, you know, on value proposition, implementation architecture. I think there are a lot of examples now internationally to draw on, uh, but it's not like, you know, anybody has totally cracked this. I think this is the task that everybody has solved for itself, partly because this is about how you collaborate and organize collective action. Um, and that is very much culture and society dependent. So the solution that works for Malaysia is not necessarily the solution that works for Portugal. You know, you have to work out what, 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 what's kind of right for, uh, right, right for you. Um, plus the base economic development, uh, you know, just uh, to mention that quickly, uh, I think Porter's early studies were very much about, you know, let's look at a number of clusters and figure out what they individually needed to do. Um, I think what we've seen now is that clusters, what they really are, are a lens to organize your economic policy. So they recognize that you, you need to improve the business environment. So what, what, what we have here on the, um, on the vertical axis, uh, so the skills, infrastructure, access to finance, rules and regulations, and so on, re research infrastructure, but with an understanding what, what a specific sector needs. If you don't do that, if you don't make, uh, make these fundamental changes, every gain that you have by attracting a company or an investment is very short-term based and it's just a reflection of maybe subsidies that you give. So you need to understand the fundamentals. At the same time, you need also that accelerator. You know, you need to attract those type of investments and that often requires financial instruments or making it attractive for them. Clusters are about how, how we combine these two forces to improve the business environment, our capabilities and assets, but with an understanding of the specific needs of real industries and markets 
that we decide to compete on. Now, let me end with, with, with a few uh, uh, comments on Portugal. So in, in many ways, I think Portugal is, is in the rest of Europe looked at as a real success story after the European terror and debt crisis. And you know, here's an, uh, a headline from, uh, from the FT from a couple of years back. My concern is that, that what you've done is, is, is indeed manage this crisis well. You've re-achieved macroeconomic stability, but you can actually achieve macroeconomic stability at quite low levels of productivity and wages. And so what Portugal hasn't quite uh, at the same time been able to do is to enhance the underlying capability of its economy to drive higher productivity, which again would also allow you to pay higher wages and you know, address some of the social tensions that you see in your society is probably, probably also reflected uh, uh, in the election results. Um, so you know, some data here, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, overall statement from the European Commission in its last assessment of the Portugal uh, economy um, so macroeconomic stability, yes, that all looks much better, but productivity growth actually looks, if anything, even worse. And you know, your starting point was already quite difficult. Part of it is low capital intensity, um, but I think overall, you know, we really need to work on those drivers of productivity. So in that sense, you can almost say, said, you know, the Porter study has failed uh, to set Portugal on that track towards really trying to address productivity uh, uh, and, and upgrade it further. Now, one of the things, you know, when I looked a little bit at the, the, the data that I found quite interesting, you know, the, the most recent big European initiative was the Next Generation EU funds to help countries to kind of recover uh, uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. Portugal has made good, you know, large use of these, both in terms of the, uh, the grant part, which, is has, which is, it has used to 100%, but also the, the debt part, so taking on additional debt as, as allowed through the program, where it's one of the fewer countries that have really used that. Um, here's an analysis that the commission has done on the so-called breadth and depth of reforms. Um, so is the financing and the investment supported by sufficient policy reforms in other areas within the country that would drive competitiveness? And, you know, I mean, Portugal doesn't look terrible uh, but you're sort of below the average on both dimensions. You know, and one is, uh, you know, whether it's the right areas and then the, the other is the number of reforms. Um, they might got their analysis wrong, but it's somewhat worrying uh, that Portugal is not a top performer here because I think that would signal that you really have a very strong agenda to use the money in concert with real reforms in the markets and in, 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 in your sectors uh, to upgrade uh, your competitiveness. So let me end with this. And, uh, you know, I have to admit, this is a, a slide that is not that changed from two years ago, uh -huh. uh, because I think that broader assessment, uh, in my view, you know, seems to still hold from, from the very cursory assessment that I've, that I've, that I've done here. Uh, so you've, you've, you've made a lot of progress uh, uh, in Portugal in terms of macroeconomic Stability, you've basically followed the EU advice on a lot of these macroeconomic things, but the productivity performance continues to be very weak. Um, and overall, that means you know you achieve stability, but at very low levels of prosperity. So what could be done? Well, um, I, you know, I think thinking about a, a new strategy, and maybe that's a task for uh, whatever new government might emerge out of this difficult situation after the election yesterday is really to think about a strategy that talks about the positioning of Portugal within specific markets within the global economy going forward, taking account of the changes that I mentioned and the broader, uh, broader changes in the global environment, both in terms of economics, but also in terms of the expectations uh, that societies have uh, towards long-term competitiveness of their locations. So let me let me stop here and uh, look forward to to comment. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian. I think it was a very good insight for the discussion. We have, as I told you here, with us uh, people that have some uh, different responsibilities and experience on these terms of questions and uh, competitiveness. Uh, I will ask for Anna Lemon. She will speak with us tomorrow, but uh, we start the usual with the ladies. Anna, do you want to make a small comment uh, about Christian? I know that you know very well Christian. But if you want to make a, a slight comment about these uh, topics that uh, Christian told, and then I will pass to other people so that we have other questions. 
Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, Christian. It has been a very interesting uh, start of conversation, I think. So, yes, uh, Christian, you, you talked about the crucial thing is how to pass to the implementation and improve this in practice. Uh, so uh, maybe I make a few uh, comments here because, in fact, we, we seem to be trapped on a low productivity, uh, well, indeed a trap. Uh, and this, you know, has many causes and I don't want to, to discuss that in detail. Uh, yes. But it's been a long time. It's been a long time that we can't get out of this. One of the issues, I think, I think it's a pity, and uh, here I'm not neutral because I defend a much uh, more strategic role for manufacturing industry. I think it's much more, you know, when a, you know, a, a group of sectors that underpin uh, innovation, much more than other ways that have been uh, incentivized in Portugal. Uh, reinforcement of the tradable uh, sectors in our economy because we've been also focusing a lot and giving incentives on non-tradable activities and distributing in a non-targeted and non-strategic way several incentives. So so here uh, also uh, maybe I, I bring to the table also our chronic deficit of managerial capabilities as well. And probably, you know, like, uh, quite asphyxiating um, role of, of the tax and fiscal policy that doesn't help uh, as well. But in fact, I think we we, we kind of, uh, we know several things, but then how to put them in practice is the, the issue. And in my point of view, because we have such a, an incredible industrial tradition and we are good in several sectors, some sectors have been uh, doing their job quite well, but somehow uh, we, we in the last couple of decades, we haven't bet on the manufacturing industry. And now with the opportunity of digital transformation with the 4.0 industry revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, I think it's, uh, it's been seriously neglected. That's uh, the other, the other um, thing maybe I think it's important is also the fact that we, we've been assisting to different paradoxes. For example, in the north of Portugal, which is the industrial heart of the nation in terms of manufacturing, somehow it's uh, we cannot escape to the, from this trap as well, because although although there, there's also issues related to, to the way statistics are accounted for, et cetera, that we somehow tend to, to, to not reflect uh, on uh, the the real value added uh, by, by the firms and end up being somehow misled by by the by the statistics. But overall, I think uh, I think we we have a problem of and Julia is both in the public sector, so I bring this to the table for discussion. Okay. Hello? Yes, yes, I think we were listening very badly to you, uh, and now we are listening better, okay. Okay. Now we have with us, uh, Anna, we didn't uh, I listen to you, I will pass it now to uh, Luis Miramaral, Luis Miramaral was the minister when Porter was here 30 years ago. Do you want okay. to make... Okay, I will pass it around then, so that we have a discussion with it. Okay, and thank you very much for your insights. It was important. Tomorrow you will be with us and uh, Francisco Los in a very interesting, uh, smart discussion about innovation. So, Jim uh, do you want to make some comment, please? Okay, yes. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. When I launch, launch, uh, Porter Computers Report 30 years ago, I was mainly concentrating microeconomic dimension. Why? Because the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance were quite aware of macroeconomic stability, but not about micro, micro policy. So I, I was very focused about it, but I know very well that to, nowadays we have to, to trend that at the time we didn't trend. I refer to the Chinese threats and the the green transition. And there I think that uh, Europe is too much concentrated in the green transition and forgetting the competitiveness, uh, the competitiveness. So Europe wants to clean the world and uh, 
but we account only for the seven percent of CO2 emissions. So it did make sense. It doesn't make sense that we alone want to to cut the emissions, forgetting the the other geographies are increasing more and more the CO2 emissions. And obviously, I think that the Euro European Commission, mainly with first Timmermans want only to concentrate in the green transition and they forgot completely the, the competitiveness dimension. Obviously, I remember in the Horizon Europe, the former Portuguese commissioner, Taj Moedas, tried to launch a new pillar, the, the innovation, because uh, 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 Horizon Europe has now three pillars, First one, the traditional research pillar. Second one, the industrial competitiveness. And now the innovation pillar. I think it's very interesting, this pillar to finance the innovation, the startups and their partnership in yes. the European community. So that's a good idea. But about Portugal, I can say you that we have macro stability, but with low levels of productivity and low wage. We didn't care about productivity. We have balanced budgets, but with very high public expenditure, namely current public expenditure, because we suppressed the public investment. And so obviously with the high tax, this is not God, good for economy, mainly for corporations and families, because the tax are very, very high in the, our Europe, Portuguese framework. We can say that all the other European countries they have, have higher tax than Portugal, but we must take into account our level of development. In the in our with our level of development, I think we have very very high taxes in Portugal. And the, uh, another comment about the next generation EU. Obviously, this finance our resilient recovery program. <laughs> But I think this this program is mainly concentrated in, to finance the public investment that we didn't uh, invest in the previous years because we want to control the budget. And now this program, uh, the government had the opportunity with the program to 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 finance heavily the public investment and not the competitiveness of our company. So. It's, we have a very, very bad mix in Portugal. And I I, I don't disagree when the, I, I see some socialist men proposing to, cho to choose sectors. I will say that I would like more to, to think about clusters than sectors. So I I didn't I, 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 I didn't contest that we can do some sectorial approach or even to to, to, to think about clusters, but they forget completely the business environment. So I, I, I criticize them, not because they want to be more selective about clusters or sectors, but because they ought to do it, but they forget the, the general levels of competitiveness in business environment. Yeah. Obviously in the market economy is very, very important. So I am not very optimistic about the, the future of uh, our economy. I think that the new government will, will have a hard, hard job if they, they want to correct the mistakes that we have in Portugal. Thank you Thank very much. much. Well. We have a, a discussion with uh, this topic also with uh, Lucia Manuel, that was the minister on the 6th of May, but we'll inform about that. To close this first session, Fernando Freire Sosa, that is also a person that was Secretary of State and the President of the North Commission. Do you want to make some comment? about the Christian topic? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for your for your presentation. And uh, uh, I would like to not not necessarily to comment, but to ask you yes. some elaborations and further elaboration on three or four things that you said. Uh, one is the the brussels based uh, strategy uh, how do you uh, how do you analyze you have, you you have said that brussels based uh, strategy is not perhaps the most uh, interesting for some countries like portugal uh, how do you uh, make 
the link between the Brussels um, the Brussels based strategy and the, the accession to funds and the, the national choices that you have to to do in terms of having an an industrial policy and so uh, uh, some some policy concerned with uh, competitiveness. The second thing is that uh, uh, was already mentioned, and you mentioned it in the first slide, uh, referring the max manufacturing led growth, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, Anna Lehmann also referred to to that. My question, being being agreeing with that, my question is: How do you uh, relate that with the economies? Uh, the, the, the 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 increasing level of uh, services in the economies in the modern economies. The 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 third is the uh, to ask you a sort of opinion of uh, what would be interesting to do thirty years after in terms of a national strategy that can add uh, some. Uh, Real value, purpose to the to the national economy in terms of Portugal. How do you relate that with the 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 way the, the Porter report was organized, and uh, do you think something of the same kind uh, of uh, of same uh, type could be used, or do you think it would have to be a, a very different? Uh, uh, experience and a very different uh, uh, way of doing. And the, the last one is the connection between your uh, analysis of competitiveness uh, with the complexity uh, framework approach of Ausman and uh, uh, those kind of uh, works coming from uh, uh, also from Harvard in, in a certain sense. And uh, how do you how do you compare uh, those uh, those uh, those works with yours? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have here this year a lots of uh, inputs. As I told you, we have here with us a lots of people that are very very keen on this topic. So the conversation will be good. So please answer, and then we'll pass to a second round. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, no, really interesting to listen to the comments, and uh, thank you for the uh, for the questions. Of course, uh, you know, complex questions. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll I'll try to give my best to to start at least an answer um, uh, without giving a second lecture. But so, so the first point on on the balance between Brussels and what needs to done to be done locally. I think as as uh, you know, Minister Amaral also pointed out. You know, I think there are concrete questions that Portugal needs to address in terms of what sectors provide opportunities, what are competitive advantages that you can build in Portugal. Um, and those are questions that only you can answer. Uh, I think those can't be answered in Brussels. I think what Brussels can do is first of all, you know, to provide the right type of macro context in terms of the single market and so on, but then provide tools that help you to implement your strategy, tools that might require economies of scale, linking you into the European science system, uh, providing, you know, through the European Innovation Fund and other instruments, tools, the structural funds, and so on. But it needs to be clear that you are in charge, or any other member country has to be in charge of how are these tools and instruments going to be applied given the specific context of your country. In principle, I think the whole, you know, so-called semester process uh, uh, after the Lisbon strategy goes very much in that direction. But the reality has been that the semester process in Brussels has to be very focused on macroeconomic stability and macroeconomic balance and on basically agreeing what are the European priorities and then you know, asking what can Portugal or Sweden or Germany do to support these, these, uh, uh, these European uh, um, uh, priorities. And I think there we made a mistake sort of in the way that we've set this up. Um, and by the way, this is a problem more for Portugal and Hungary and Poland. It's actually not so much a problem for Sweden and Germany because, you know, in, in, in those countries, the structural funds and what the European Union does, it has less of an influence and it's more the national policies that matter. And so that also creates sort of an imbalance in the European political system that I think is, is highly problematic. But, uh, you know, 
So that was on the first point. The second one on manufacturing led, led, led growth. I think what we've seen, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm working with the Indian government who tries to now finally get manufacturing going and let get a, get a lot of in, uh, investment going to some, to follow the the Asian growth model. The trouble is that nowadays employment in manufacturing is much more high skill. Uh, so it's not the traditional way to get people from your agricultural sector into industry and then upgrade them. Um, and the sector is smaller in terms of employment numbers, not necessarily in terms of GDP shares. It's still true what, what Anna Lehmann said, you know, this is a sector with high productivity, very high innovative capacity. So you need these islands. But if you think about the broader impact of your economy, you also think, need to think about the service-related activities that are around that, from design to services to, uh, you know, all the other activities that, that, that are there. We need to mobilize the broader set of our economy, including by the, also some sectors that, you know, like education and healthcare that we usually just think about as a cost factor or as a, uh, as a social service. But, you know, that's a big part of our economy in the future as well. So I think there is a, uh, a change required. Um, then let me let me move to the last one and, and then go to the uh, um, to the uh, you know how to do a strategy. The last one was the que question on complexity. Um, uh, I think Ricardo Hausmann is a great guy. He's a great communicator. Uh, I think what they see, of course, in their data is very much in line with also what Porter has ha has seen that as an economy progresses, two things are starting to happen. One is the set of economic activities that can profitable, profitably undertaken in that economy broadens. So we see that you know, a competitive economy like Germany has many more sectors in which it is active uh, than a less uh, a productive one. So it's broader and it's also moving into different types of sectors and different activities within those sectors. So more uh, you know, human capital intensive, capital intensive, higher productivity. That's what they, you know, uh, uh, what, what they find also in the complexity. The question I think is, what are the policy conclusions? And I think there is, you know, I, I sometimes have then discussions with them, and of course we often work in the same countries. Uh, that I think the complexity work lets gets policymakers very focused on what's the right sector, but it doesn't really tell them on what do you need to do to grow that sector and make it more competitive. And if the politicians are not very smart, then they say, okay, you know, let's just use a lot of subsidies in order to get that more complex, more attractive sector going in our economy. And as Minister Amaral also mentioned, you know, ultimately you need to improve the environment. So I think the complexity analysis can help you. It can focus you on interesting opportunities for your economy. And then, but then the second step is figuring out what needs to be done. And there, I think Porter's work around the diamond and so on and the cluster structure opens up the perspective to something that that in the long term can be uh, can be more effective. So so it's not uh, an either or. I think these are very complementary um, approaches. But I, I I think the competitiveness and cluster perspective hasn't lost its power, if you will, um, versus complexity. And so then finally, you know, what would we do different now? I I wasn't involved uh, in the study 30 years ago, so I you know I I can't exactly see. Um, um, what was done there, I saw that the earlier studies were, in my view, a little bit too focused on kind of just the individual clusters, rather than to see sort of what's the national story. Uh, I think more focus on, you know, what are the competitive advantages rather than what are the right type of sectors. Um, and then I think, you know, as, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I think the, the, the sole question on implementation, implementation architecture, you know, how do you organize yourself? Um, how do we do things differently, not just what needs to be done, but how are we going to, uh, to do it differently? I think I would put more focus on that. Uh, and you could do that both on the topic of research, but also on the way that you organize the research. So nowadays, I think um, it's not just so, so much about getting some experts in to do the analysis, but more facilitating a process using experts within Portugal, you know, business leaders. You, ultimately, what I've seen changes through these type of projects uh, is not so much that countries actually adopt the type of action plans that we've derived in these type of studies, uh, but that they change people's minds, that there are some decision makers that started to think differently about, you know, what, what they no needed to do. And that sort of has a long term uh, impact. But uh, let, let me let me stop here. Thanks. Uh, other people that uh, I think that can have 
some comment on that. Let's start again with uh, some some woman we have here, Ondina Alfonso, that is the manager of the agro alimentary culture a class, sorry, that has been a successful case of the competitiveness. Ondina, do you want some comment or some question to to, to Christian? Well, uh, thank you. First of all, I'm I'm, I'm uh, driving, but anyway, no I problem, just no uh, drop it. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the presentation. Well, um, whenever we talk about uh, clusters or sectors, uh, I, I would say that there is a, a, a trend to forget uh, retailers. Uh, I and as as you might know, I'm working uh, in the in a, one of the retailers in Portugal. And um, I think the way that we see retailers could be in this uh, partnership that industry and production uh, can make uh, more than commercial uh, partnership, but beyond that, looking for sustainability now that we are talking about, but also uh, about competitiveness and all, all the things that we can um, uh, put inside this uh, competitiveness. I think um, retailers are uh, a key uh, actor and uh, they have a key role on uh, on uh, competitiveness because uh, we are talking about, for example, uh, technology that we need uh, to communicate with our suppliers. We are talking about uh, AI, but we are also talking about uh, very simple systems that we need to have to be uh, to have online and on time information. But also we can uh, talk about uh, new product development, uh, innovation, so many things that we can um, have uh, and uh, use to um, look for uh, the competitiveness of our, our country. But yes, I, I would say that the lack still is uh, uh, related with productivity and productivity uh, may be uh, grounded on the needs that we have of uh, innovation and uh, cannot be uh, robotic, but can be very simple uh, needs that we uh, still are facing with our uh, small suppliers. Most of them uh, are SMEs, so we, we really need this uh, boost of uh, innovation, but simple innovation to, to make uh, this uh, link and this uh, relationship uh, more effective. Okay. Thank you very much, Undina. We have also with us Cash Tavares that has made some Thank studies you. recently. Thank you very much on that. Cash, do you want to make some comments, some uh, question to Christian? Very, very, very brief, briefly, because actually I, I will have to leave in, in five minutes. Okay. But, um, um, when I listen to you, and sometimes you made some parallel with uh, Sweden, there, there cannot be countries more different than uh, in terms of economic policy, I mean, uh, than Portugal and, and Sweden. Uh, so actually, we have a problem of competitiveness because we did not do our job. That's uh, as simple as that for, for many years. We know what we have to do, but we simply don't do it uh, because uh, it's easier for sometimes to, uh, to look for the fund, the European funds and so on. And I think we have relied, as Anna mentioned, too much on the European funds without criteria many, many times, without the right incentives. On the contrary, the incentives were all turned to the non-tradable uh, sectors and that uh, that was a misallocation of, of resources that has cost a lot to the, the Portuguese economy. Uh, uh, we have cyclical financial crisis and we, uh, fortunately it's not that, uh, the case now, but, uh, but uh, we had several that uh, uh, made us to have a, 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 what we call the, a stop and go policy we, we grow and then we have to stop, then we grow again, we have to stop and so on. In the opposite side, you have Sweden, which is a case of an innovative country that relies just on its own policies. Uh, actually, Sweden has preserved the independence of the macroeconomic policies because as you have the, your own currency, you, you have the monetary and the exchange rate policy in, in your hands, which is not uh, the case. You had a severe 
financial crisis in the beginning of the 90s. But after that, Sweden entered the right path and uh, Sweden pa passed, for instance, the 2008 or 2007 financial crisis without severe, severe problems because uh, after the, the previous crisis, Sweden has done things uh, relatively well in the banking in the banking sector. So there could not be more differences between the, the, the two countries. And uh, I, I think Sweden is actually a good example of how to do things. And uh, I, I am uh, always a bit jealous when I listen to Sweden and, and Germany saying that, oh, we have a problem, we are growing, we, uh, we have a slow growth. Uh, I, I wish I, we had the problem of growth of Sweden and Germany because it's a, a slow growth, uh, uh, a problem of growth at a very high level of income and not a very low uh, at a low level in income as ours. So I I I, I, I think that um, probably uh, 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 what's with the Swedish case and others, but uh, in particular the Swedish case uh, shows is that if you follow the right policies with determination and uh, with, in continuity you'll get the 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 good re, the re, good results uh, if you try to you know uh, in, to invent uh, uh, or, or to to suppose that the governments can have the wisdom to choose what the the entrepreneurs should do or or not do i think that not not lead to a good result uh, okay. in particular in innovation sweden sweden has, has shown how things should be done. That, that's an uh, uh, exterior uh, uh, from, the, from from outside, uh, as I see it. Probably you know much more than than I. But uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, um, Sweden is really good, a good example of, of how to perform good policies aimed to competitiveness. Thank you very much. And you know, Carlos made recently a very important study on the Portuguese economy with such. It was a very, very interesting uh, and it was presented uh, in Lisbon and no Porto. Yeah. And he launched a book also. Christian, can you comment to this question? Then we pass to the final three questions, okay? So that we have uh, the time. So... Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so first of all, I mean, let me fully agree that, of course, the situations are entirely different. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living here in Sweden, you know, I'm more critical about the situation here and I see what needs to be improved. But I also agree with Carlos that it's, you know, it's uh, it's moaning on a, on a high level of prosperity. You know, that's that's definitely, um, definitely true. Um, I, I would say, you know, I think what, what, what we see and there's maybe a similarity, I think that, that there is a lack of strategy. I think Sweden has had a model that worked very well exactly since the financial crisis of the late 90s. And I think there was basically broad political consensus on what that should look like, you know, macroeconomic stability, focus on innovation, um, you know, actually quite a lot of use of the market, although that's not what people usually associate with Sweden, but um, quite a lot of use of competition in many in many areas. I think the, the question is, you know, are we now at a sort of a breaking point where the global economic context is changing so much that uh, Sweden and others have to find a new role? Uh, whether the answer is yes or no, it's, it's it's not quite clear, but I think it will require more integration of answers across different areas, also in connection of managing the green transitions. And, um, and, and you know, so, so but, I, but I take your point, Carlos, that, uh, you know, that uh, for, for Portugal, it's, it's about getting things done that are basically have been recognized for a long time and, you know, focusing on that implementation. W one comment that I want to make, I fully agree with you that once government gets into the uh, into the business of choosing what the entrepreneurs should do, it becomes very problematic. They have no better sense of what to do and they have no skin in the game. That's what I think sometimes, you know, our European strategies, including these smart specialization strategies get wrong because we get politicians to kind of play entrepreneurs and say, oh, this is the niche and that is the niche. However, I do think that government needs to listen on what are the sectors in which our entrepreneurs are active and what, what are the unique specific needs that they have. And I think we should focus on what are the competitive advantages. So what are the qualities of our business environment that we need to build on? 
they will be more or less relevant to some sectors. And, you know, we don't know that. I mean, I think that's what for entrepreneurs to figure yeah. out. But there we need to make choices because, you know, we can't just say, okay, you know, we, we want to improve everything at the same time. That's not going to work in terms of the implementation. I, I agree with you. <laughs> okay. We have also we, uh, with us, uh, I don't know, Dr. Cash Costa, I think you are here with us. Do you want to make some comments on the uh, topic? I don't know if you are not listening. Are you are you seeing me? Yes, yes, of course. So I, I, want to a, a stress, I want to stress I want to stress a point is that we need to distinguish between cre creating conditions for entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in itself. And I think that there is always the illusion that the state can be uh, an entrepreneur. If the state is able to provide conditions for entrepreneurship is doing well, is job. To ask for more is to ask for a waste of money. And uh, I stay with this, uh, with this statement because I think that there is always the idea that there is someone with a special knowledge that will replace economic agents and the entrepreneurs. It's impossible. We need to create the environment, and the environment means to create an innovation system made by education, research, training, and at the same time to create a bridge between this innovation system and the entrepreneurial sector, corporate sector, and the small and medium enterprises, knowing that entrepreneurship is part an individual uh, affair, but it's also a corporate affair. And the part of the entrepreneurship comes from within corporate sector. And for that, it's necessary that the organizations are big enough to have the capacity to incorporate knowledge. And the main question that we need to, to ask ourselves about the Portugal is why firms stay small and why they, they, they are dead after three generations in general, and why they decline after being a success at the beginning. And this is the main point and they need to ask, what are the reasons beyond this uh, failure to grow, failure to go, to go public, and failure to, to uh, attract capital, equity capital, and to attract the new knowledge and the new competences. Without a, a firm sector that is big enough to incorporate knowledge, without an innovation system that is able to transmit or to pass through knowledge to the corporate sector, without the bridge factors that will increase this transference of knowledge, without a state that is beyond the innovation system, providing education, research, and training, without a clear understanding that education needs to be ended oriented, this means to the corporate sector, that the research needs to be ended oriented, and without a clear understanding that there is a need of, of a dialogue between the corporate sector and the innovation system, it's impossible to get the best of the money, public money that we spend. And we spend money, but we don't get what we are spending. It's the main point that we need to, to, to point is that we need a state that is efficient. We don't need a state that is an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship is not something for the state, it's something for economic agents and for the corporate sector, and the corporate sector itself is a collective, a collective uh, entrepreneur. And the main, the main innovation comes from within the firms that already are, are, are in the market. And what we need is to see how to bring this uh, corporate sector to an innovation mood in order to make possible that they will go uh, from a product to another one, from a sector to another one, in order to take advantage of their corporate culture and of their uh, corporate knowledge. 
So I stay in that point because there are people that are a lot more specialized mm -hmm. than myself in this topic. But for me, it's clear if the state takes care of the innovation system and uh, all the environment that uh, is useful for corporate sector is doing well. If it goes beyond that, is forgetting something because it's not possible <coughs> to do everything. And it's at the same time creating obstacles or difficulties to the corporate sector. Thank you very much, Lukash Costa. Lukash Costa is a very experienced economist and, of course, has a long tradition in saying that. Pedro Saraiva, do you want to make some comment? He's someone that has also some experience in these topics of innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, th thank you so much and congratulations for uh, yet another very interesting, uh, insightful presentation. I just had a, a question to Christian. Uh, we just got to do a little bit, not, not so much with what we said, which, which I think is very clear. So you need to have a good idea about where to go. But more and more what I see is that visions that do things and make things happen fast and change uh, in an agile way, I think that's a, a capability which is uh, becoming more and more important for you to be competitive. So I, I'd like to learn about your opinion because I, I didn't see that dimension, right? Regardless of your plan, being agile, being lean as a society, making decisions, uh, I'm not going to talk once again about the Portuguese airport, right? <laughs> that, that, that's from why the way I see it where Europe is losing it because it takes too long that there is no such uh, speed of uh, decision speed of implementation and even if you are not doing it right you just pivot and do, go somewhere else so I, I'd like to know if, if you think that that should be a part of uh, the frameworks for analyzing competitiveness because th that's what I, I see as being the difference between <clears throat> countries that are becoming the future and the ones that uh, are eventually not uh, any longer leading uh, mm. what the future is going to be. Okay. And uh, to finalize, uh, Christian, we have also with us here Philippe Fischer that has a long experience in health cluster and in health sector. Philippe, do you want to make some comment about your experience in a very innovation sector like health? I don't know. Philippe, I don't know if you... Uh, listen. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, okay. I cannot uh, yes. turn my, my camera on. If you um, want to make some comment on uh, your experience in this competitiveness with the health sector that you know very well. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for the uh, excellent presentation and very straightforward. Um, it's um, in the healthcare sector, we are seeing uh, a huge demand on the um, on having more services um, and also having more literacy on the people, not just running or going to the hospital, but more on having uh, more knowledge and digital um, care at a distance. And it's, um, you know, the population, it's uh, the demographics of the population in Portugal is, um, is getting older. One of, of the fastest one uh, getting older uh, around Europe and uh, on the other sense, I mean, the, we cannot afford to have beds and doctors and nurses for everyone. So um, there is um, right now, I think, all over Europe. And uh, it's good that we, uh, our average uh, life, it's becoming longer. But we uh, need to struggle uh, in terms of uh, the investment that we do in health and how we can get more benefit of investment in, in health. So. Uh, how we position innovation and the economic part of health um, uh, to the ecosystem of healthcare, uh, looking at every um, intervenient or every persona that we have in the healthcare system is also um, a key issue right now on the, on the financial sustainability of the, of the model. Um, and of course, it has to be another one, but how we can put innovation on this and on the on the graphs that you were showing around Europe and the investments that the European Union is putting, um, of course we have a good, uh, very good leverage on putting pilots working, but then it's very difficult to establish this um, on a bigger scale and to export this knowledge because Portugal is a very good uh, showcase for um, innovation for testing technology, especially in the healthcare system. 
but then we don't uh, we still uh, are struggling to to put more this innovation and more this uh, transformation in the healthcare system so that we uh, in one hand be more healthy for longer um, and have a benefit of the economic side because we could um, effectively uh, we have good expertise very good human resources um, we can put innovation on this but then um, we are still struggling on um, how we can uh, upscale this all this innovation and all this transformation that could be uh, also um, uh, for me um, one of the main goals of the of the country uh, to develop this side of health economics and how we can um, uh, leverage this knowledge that we have and this expertise to the outside, to the European Union or to other regions. Okay. So um, uh, this is my thoughts on okay. this. Thank you. So, Christian, I think uh, we can conclude with uh, all these topics that I'm making and then a uh, final remark, okay? Thank you very much. Very good. Well, uh, first on uh, Philippa, thank you for, for your comment. Uh, fully agree. I mean, I, I, I do think that the healthcare sector is, uh, for the demographic reasons that you mentioned, uh, it, you know, it's an increasing share of our economy in all of our countries. Uh, and so I think we need to think both about the social impact that it has, as well as the economic impact that it has. That might require organizing it differently. Uh, you know, I mean, Porter worked a lot on, on value-based healthcare, which, uh, you know, was focused very much on how to, how, how to think about how we can organize the sector in a way that actually serves the interests of the patients and, and, and the health, comes that, health outcomes that that generates. Um, that kind of thing that can be done in a way that also recognizes that there is a huge employment opportunity, there are products and services that can come out of this. So I, I don't have a solution for the problem that you mentioned, but I think this is clearly one of the areas and, uh, in which to work. And it sounds like Portugal has interesting assets and, and opportunities at least to work on um, uh, to do something th there. Um, and there's, a, by, by the way, I think there's a connection between then the traded and the non-traded, which Anna Lehmann also mentioned. I mean, the traded indeed is the engine of the economy, but, but, but since most of the job creation is increasingly in the non-traded sector, in, including the health, healthcare sector, it's really about how do we understand the linkages between the two? It's not either or, but it's, it's really how do we combine those different, different elements? Um, and then the you know the the, the comment before I, I I fully agree that you know I think we need to think much more about what makes countries better able to build and leverage the assets that they create you know so so what's the capacity to do good design and implement good policies um, and certainly what I what I see you know when I when I work in Asia is that they basically don't think that the Western model whether it's European or the U S model is really working and 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 uh, uh, you know, they think our, our system is so, sort of not something that they aspire to. Um, I'm not sure they have a much better working model. Um, and so sort of the reliance on individual strong leaders, uh, I, I don't think is really a, a substitute for it. But, but clearly, we need to really address this head on and think about how we can improve our, um, uh, our policy design and implementation mechanisms. I think this is becoming so important now because the challenges that we are facing are not challenges that can be solved by a specialist in a narrow, well-designated area. Issues are so interconnected. Uh, you know, green transition, I think, is a good example. You know, we need new innovation. We need new skills. We need to think about financing. We need to think about the market structures that we're designing. And this cuts across different agencies and different ministries of any government. Um, and we need to integrate that better. That's what, what I'm at the European level even more worried about, because I mean, the commission model that we have is not, it's not even like a government that we have in, in any individual country. I mean, it's commissioners from different countries, often from different political groups. And, and almost by design, they sort of focus on the interest and the logic of their area, rather than on how can we collaborate in doing what's right for Europe uh, overall. So, you know, the environmental commissioner focuses on higher, higher um, goals there, and then the industry commissioner focuses on more industrial policy, and the trade commissioner wants free trade and so on. Unless we overcome that, I don't think we are going to make much progress uh, uh, in Europe. And, and uh, 
for a country like Portugal, I think that is enormously critical. Uh, this is not an excuse. I mean, you need to, as, as, as some of the gentlemen and, and ladies on the call said, you know, you need to do your homework. You need to do what, what you know needs to be done within Portugal. But I think there's also a question of what type of Europe do you need so that Portugal can succeed? Uh, and I think that's a discussion that that hopefully will will start in earnest after the European uh, elections. And you know, when we talk about a new commission, and um, um, it's a hard discussion, it's a very difficult discussion. But I think we, we've we've sort of tried in, in in Europe, just you know, continuing the same thing and trying harder and giving it different names and coming from a different angle. But we haven't seen changed sort of the structure in which we have implemented, uh, designed and implemented our policies. And I. I believe we need to make progress there, and th those ideas, you know, hopefully, can also come from the member countries like Portugal. Christian, yeah, thank you very much for your keynote. We hope that you can visit us very soon. It was a pleasure to receive you. Thank you very much for all of you that were here tomorrow. As I told you, we are going to have another session about innovation with Anna Lemon that was here today. Thank you, Anna, and with. Um, Francisco Flores, that is now the dean of FCA, the very important business school in the world. So, thank you very much. We'll be in thank touch you. and have a nice Bye week, okay? Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a nice week. Bye-bye. Thank you.